slow start today to a busy week ahead. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romain Boston. And I'm Alex Steele. Did you see it? I did see it. I got a little peekaboo look of the eclipse. But the totality of it, that's going to come right in the middle of our show. Yes, we're really looking forward yeah. to it. Wait for the totality, but you can catch it out at your window. Just wear those glasses. All right. In terms of the market action, i got to be honest, guys. We're not seeing that much action pretty much anywhere. The S&P is just up to one-tenth of one percent. You are seeing a bit of a sell-off in the bond market. We see uh, yearly highs across the board from the twos all the way through the tens. Gold, though, still getting a bid, which is a bit of a head-scratcher. Is it a safe haven? It is an inflation play, is a store of value. I'm not sure because Bitcoin is also getting another leg up, up by about 4%, Romain. Yeah, absolutely here. We talk about the price action in the stock and bond markets being pretty tepid today here. But I do want to take a closer look at a couple of the things you had on the board there. Let's start with gold. Spot gold today having its third biggest price swing of the year, at least when you measure from the intraday peak to trough. It was a swing that briefly breached another record high, and as we start the show, is now reclaiming that record high as we get closer uh, to settlement. And it's raising a lot of questions out there about who is actually buying and why. Remember, the fairly steady trading range that we had for months was finally busted out in early March. That's been part of what has been a 14% rally since. And futures traders, if you look at the data, betting on additional gains with the number of outstanding contracts here in New York continuing to swell. And then, of course, you have China out there. The most recent data released over the weekend showing the 17th straight month of purchases by the central bank over there in China. And as gold bounces around those record highs, the stalled Bitcoin rally also appears to have found that springboard. Prices up for a third straight trading day, back above 72,000 at one point in the day. And when you take a ratio comparing the price of Bitcoin with the second largest asset, Ether, there is evidence of more resilient demand ahead. QCP Capital writing in a note on Friday that this pattern could be a very early signal of FOMO but cautions on how quickly that FOMO can flip to no-no. Now, some of the trends we have been seeing in areas like gold and crypto are tied to the shift in inflation expectations and the follow-through, of course, to a shift in Fed rate cut expectations. Now, just a couple of months ago, it looked like the inflation trade was all but dead. The Bloomberg U.S. Treasury Inflation Link Bond Index was down 2% to start the year, but a series of reports that we've gotten since then has shown a resurgent price pressure creating an interesting risk tilt this week for those CPI and PPI reports, Alex, which come out on Wednesday and Thursday, respectively. I'm glad you ended on inflation there because something that I've been thinking about are the different components uh, to inflation. That leads me to this very messy yet very cool chart. So bear with me here because the areas that are really important are the energy index, which are those orange bars, and then the core goods index, which is the yellow bar. So during the pandemic, you can see energy really spiked and was a big part of what we saw in CPI as well as goods. Now, what's happened over the last year or so is that energy has be, has become disinflationary, but does that wind up changing now with oil at 90? And you see that tiny yellow line there? Well, that's goods infla uh, disinflation. We really kind of cut right down there at September of last year. Now, the question that I have, does that continue? So it's not so much will inflation pick back up, it's that will the disinflation that we've seen actually stall? And that's where I think that the Francis Key Scott Bridge in Baltimore and the inflation readings are going to become a lot more complicated and maybe a lot more interesting, Romain. All right. This is a perfect uh, setup and a perfect question for our first guest as we kick you off to the close here on this Monday afternoon. Michael Pond, he's head of global inflation market strategy at Barclays, joining us right now at Studio Two here in New York. And Michael, this is really now the debate here. I mean, nobody thinks we're going back to the battle days of 9% headline CPI, but that disinflationary trend has certainly hit some speed bumps here. Are those just speed bumps, or are we going to maybe be talking about a reversal? It's well, the uh, past couple of months yeah. indicate that we have stalled out. So mm -hmm. goods price inflation, still very weak, mm -hmm. uh, negative or, or almost negative. So it's, it's pretty low. That's going to be, that's going to continue. But shelter inflation continues to run strong within services. Mm -hmm. That could continue, especially if you look at single family rents which remain very strong, and super core is described by the Fed, so core services, ex-shelter, largely tied to wages, that continues to run hot given the strong economy, or labor market numbers that we got on Friday. Is there any concern about some of the ancillary events? You mentioned the Francis Scott Key, a bridge collapse, and this idea that we still have a supply chain that, at least on the margins, is still somewhat fragile here. And there's always that potential that something could be disrupted in a way that does have material price pressure. And I would put those as potentials, as, as risks to watch out for. Mm -hmm. In the direction, it's higher inflation. 
uh, just like the disruptions we saw to supply chains in the Red Sea a couple months ago, where supply chain indicators spiked up, shipping costs spiked up. They've come down, and they really haven't mattered to the overall picture. But mm -hmm. should they continue to go higher, should they broaden out, that becomes a, a big risk to the Fed. So how do you express that? What are you doing? So, you know, break-evens look very cheap across the curve. Uh, absent the, uh, once you get beyond the first couple months, mm -hmm. the market's basically priced for Fed target inflation of around 2% PC, 2.3% on CPI, as far as you can see, out to the 30 years. So structural positions in break-evens make sense to us. For now, as a tactical uh, view, we think one should be short 10-year uh, nominal treasuries. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up. So does that mean, well, would you think we see 5% on the 10-year or 3% first? Well, we saw that just about in October. So we were at 4.99, 4, so 4. I think, was the high mm -hmm. in October. So sure, we could get back there. We don't think that's likely. We certainly would, would think five is, is li more likely than three, unless there's some big crash to the economy that we don't foresee. Some big flight to, to liquidity in the market that causes the Fed to cut not 25 basis points, but 100 basis points. Mm -hmm. Again, that's not on anybody's radar, mm -hmm. but it's always a risk. So, you know, we do think there's more to go in this bond sell-off in the near term. Really? And we started to see a lot of people sort of embrace that. And there was an interesting uh, story on the Bloomberg Terminal today uh, from one of our uh, BI analysts really talking about this idea that if you do get continued upside surprises in some of these numbers here, that you still have a lot of people that are still have not sort of embraced this idea that yields could creep higher than they are. So that could create a flood. Are you expecting that? In, in mid-March, yeah. we put out a, uh, a global outlook piece with a title of U.S. and then the rest, mm -hmm. really talking about U.S. exceptionalism. When it comes to inflation, yes, but also the, the labor markets, the growth outlook uh, through the stack, growth is strong. Uh, and that's not just be, be coming, or not coming from the fiscal side, but that's certainly part of it. Mm -hmm. So the strong U.S. growth, high in, higher than target inflation, could mean that bond yields continue to move higher. Why am yeah. I not to believe that this is that Goldilocks economy that everybody talked about? Because, I mean, inflation, yeah, it may be not coming down as fast, but it's in a manageable territory, as ev evidenced by all the gains we've right, seen. Right, so the Fed has been the trying to achieve yeah. a, uh, what's been known as a soft landing. Mm -hmm. For So far, we've had no landing. Mm -hmm where the economy just keeps chugging along. It's not, it had to, it's certainly well off its highs. Mm -hmm. So inflation, you mentioned, was above 9%. We think on uh, Wednesday, uh, head over, year over year headline comes in at mm -hmm. 3.4. So yeah. much lower, but it's, it's stalled out at a pretty strong level. Do you have your eclipse glasses? I do not. I'm getting ready for the UConn game tonight. So we're gonna, okay, but do, go outside do, and look down. Don't look up. I will not look up. Okay. It's a good movie. Are you a UConn <laughs> alum? Wow, you've been keeping this a secret the whole time. So you think they're going to do it tonight? I, mean, I think it's going to be a great game. What are they, 5-0 and in championship games? I, I think it's going to be know, a great Purdue's game. Hungry. The, the bigs yeah. are, are going to go at yeah. it. You know, they got, both teams have some strong uh, centers. It's going to be a great game. All right, well, sports. a big day today between Eclipse and, as Alex <laughs> Steele just said, sports. sports. Michael Pond, <laughs> UConn alum and head of Global Inflation Market Strategy over at Barclays to kick us off to the close here on this Monday afternoon. Coming up here, we're going to take a closer look at Jamie Dimon and his annual letter to shareholders and a stark warning about AI. All right, plus you got Ulta brushing off last week's sell-off after Luke Capital gives shares a makeover. More of that in Top Calls. And we are just moments away from that total eclipse, at least here uh, in the New York area. We're going to bring you the latest on the solar eclipse mania. And believe it or not, Alex, some of the economic implications behind it, because after all, we are Bloomberg. <laughs> I love that, though. <laughs> season is coming. I think we're all asking the same question. Just how much earnings growth they're expecting. Bloomberg is first to break the numbers. Gilead is coming out right now. We have take two numbers. Shares of Pinterest. Lucid Group coming out with its earnings. All eyes right now on NVIDIA. A lot still to come. With the smartest insights. How much bigger could profit and revenue have been? Better than what the street was expecting. Bang in line with estimates. We will have full and instant analysis. It all starts Friday on Bloomberg. Context changes everything.
earnings season just around the corner. A Bloomberg Intelligence expects profits for the MAG-7 to rise 38% in the first quarter. Does it last, though? Wall Street doesn't see that trend lasting. J.P. Morgan sees that same group posting earnings growth of just 15% by the fourth quarter. Bloomberg Intelligence analyst Michael Casper joins us now for more. First off, you got your Eclipse glasses? No. 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 What is with everybody? No eclipse glasses. All right. Well, don't look, look at down. it. Don't need to look down. Yep. Um, so if we're looking at strong MAG-7 growth for earnings, what other sectors will also be strong that can kind of take the mantle here? Um, so we're really looking at tech and communications, the rest of tech and communications taking on the mantle. Um, if we're looking forward, though, into, you know, the, the rest of 2024, some things like healthcare, care, um, you know, some of the other sectors could pick up some of the slack from the MAG-7, but really, like you were saying with the, the JP Morgan report, uh, the rest of the index is really expected to catch up to the MAG-7, so the other 493 by the end of 2024, which could really cause a bit of a broadening out of sector leadership here. Uh, it, what are we priced for yeah. at this point? Like, based on that model, mm -hmm. what's accurately reflected? So we have our fair value model that we run. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a bit lower than where we are today, but a lot of that is from the macro side of things, right? So macro consensus, if you were to put that into our model, it would spit out a forecast of very anemic earnings growth for the S&P 500. And we've already blown the doors off that in the first quarter or in fourth quarter of 2023. Uh, I'm talking about when we updated the model at the end of 2023. So um, a lot of those expectations could be set to rise, especially as the, the macro data starts to clarify into a soft landing or no landing situation. Uh, but I mean, looking at the own data that your folks put out here, I mean, we're still talking about kind of half the S&P, at least on a sector basis, that still looks like it's going to be lagging. Yeah, yeah. So half the S&P yeah. 500 in, in the yeah. first quarter expected to lag, but that's expected to resolve by the third quarter. So uh, everything but energy should be growing by the third quarter, at least according to consensus. And if everything comes through the way consensus thinks it's going to come through, mm -hmm. uh, that could help broaden out the trade a little bit. By the way, uh, a lot of the broadening I'm talking about means more of a sector reversal because obviously we've had 10 of 11 sectors up year to date. So, so it, could be, it could be a little bit of a reversal in the sector picture. I am curious, too. I mean, looking at the data, I mean, there's, we obviously focus, of course, on top and bottom line, mm -hmm. what, what revenue is doing and then, of course, what EPS is doing. The last couple of quarters, though, there's been a much more focus by investors on cash flow and a lot of balance sheet health, if you yeah. will, here. Where does that fall? Have you actually taken the time to try to rank that? Yeah, so balance yeah. sheets are, are extremely healthy right mm -hmm. now. We're talking $1.2 trillion of cash just sitting on the sidelines in companies' balance sheets right now. They started to deploy a little bit of that in the form of buybacks and dividends last quarter. Uh, buybacks, by the way, up 4.7% uh, year over year. That was the first time in, in quite a while where buybacks actually grew on a year over year basis. So we're looking for that trend to continue. Uh, in the first quarter, and similarly for dividends, we've we've seen about 123 companies in the calendar first quarter uh, announce that they're increasing their dividend program. Uh, with all that cash on the sidelines, you could see more of that. If I just take a look at, say, the top sectors so far this year, communication services, number one, but that's really led by Meta. Mm -hmm. And then you have energy, and then you have tech, and then you have financials. So if we just take the cyclicals, like the energy and financials, what should we be looking at uh, for earnings growth? Yeah, so I think I think energy is just a bit of a, a mess given a lot of the comps from the previous year. So if you're looking at energy, meaning that it was so high because oil it was prices so were, high yeah. when oil prices were high that you know the comps are going to be pretty bad. Uh, on the financial side, I would say uh, what I'm really watching is is the regional banks, right? So if you think about NYCB and all the stuff that that went through last uh, quarter. I'm looking to see if there's any signs of kind of systemic issues in regional banks, especially the smaller ones and in, in some of the small cap indexes I cover. Um, but I think broadly, though, the larger uh, cap financials are, are fine. The banks are fine. Um, and what we're seeing in our sector uh, scorecard for financials is actually the credit card companies to rise up to the top within within financials. What about some of the other fintechs, that kind of the, those sort of uh, on the fringe, if you yeah. will, uh, type of financial companies? Yeah, those are actually the biggest component of financials now. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm talking about 30%. So that's the uh, diversified financials group that now contains Visa, MasterCard, Berkshire Hathaway. So, so mm -hmm. some pretty big behemoths in there. And in our model, that ranks uh, towards the middle. But it's really taken the mantle from some of those larger caps cap banks. Those were historically the biggest component of financials, and now it's over to the diversified. All right. Uh, Michael Casper uh, over at uh, Bloomberg Intelligence. A nice breakdown here uh, of the upcoming uh, earnings season. And Alex, I feel like every earnings season we come into this, we expect 
pain for the financials, and they always beat to the upside, at least the bigger ones do. We all we expect, the, expect the bloom to come off the rose of tech, and it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And then we expect that rotation into everywhere else, and that doesn't happen. Either. I know. So when does that happen? Is, that, is it going to be second quarter earnings? I, I assume at some point earnings? it's got to happen, earnings? right? I don't uh, know. Maybe yeah. after we're long and gone. Who knows? Yeah. Maybe <laughs> after the eclipse goes the second time, so 2044. Maybe, yeah. maybe we'll see that. But I, but I agree with you. And I'm having a hard time getting super jazzed about bank earnings this yeah. go around. Like, I want to be super jazzed. Yeah. But I feel like we know what they're going to do. The big guys are going to do really well. Yeah. Investment banking is going to start coming back. We're going to yeah. look at deposit beta and see what happens there. Like, yeah. it's going to be those things. And then investors will be happy on day one, and then the second day they'll sell yes. it back off again. And we'll be talking about why bank or why banks continue to lag the rest of the market. There you go. There we go. We <laughs> did it. This. We have our whole show planned out for the next few weeks. <laughs> All right, coming up here on this day here on this uh, Monday afternoon, a closer look uh, uh, at the markets. Loop Capital actually saying that uh, last week's sell-off of Ulta shares was a bit overdone. We're going to talk to the analysts about why beauty is an eye of the beholder. That's coming up mm. next here on The Close on Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for our top calls and look at some of the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start with Alphabet today. Oppenheimer lifting its price target, going to a street high, 185 bucks. That's up from about 172, and it keeps that outperform rating in place. The analyst saying Google will continue to dominate as a search engine with voice assistance and the potential integration of Gemini AI into Apple's iPhone. Shares of Google uh, Alphabet, I should say, up about a percent on the day. Next in line is Skyworks, a downgrade there to sector weight over at Key Bank. Now, this is interesting here because, of course, a big connection to Apple as well. Skyworks makes the chip devices for smartphones, but the analyst sees a growth slowdown on the horizon, and he says that more than 60% of the 5G smartphone market well, has already been penetrated. And with competitors seeking attention from Apple and Android, keeping Skyworks on its toes, he wouldn't be surprised if it turned to M&A. Those shares fractionally lower on the day. And we want to end on Ulta Beauty here. Getting a raise today to buy from hold. This over at Loop Capital Markets. The stock fell about 15% last week. This after management gave that warning about a slowdown for the first quarter. Now, the analyst over there, Anthony Jacumba, calls the sell-off overdone. He also expects Ulta sales performance to improve as new products are introduced. A bit of a bid here in the shares after last week's sell-off, 2% higher on the day. And those are our top calls. But let's stay on that last one there with Ulta. And pleased to say that Anthony Jacumba is joining us right now, senior research analyst over at Loop Capital Markets. And Anthony, let's get right to it. I mean, last week's sell-off didn't completely come out of the blue. I mean, management kind of said, look, things aren't going to be great for the first quarter. What gives you the confidence to stick behind this and, more importantly, to increase your uh, recommendation? Well, there's a couple different things. First off, look, they, they basically said that, you know, sales will be at the low end of their guidance range for the first quarter, um, low single-digit uh, percentage increase. That would imply 1% or 3%. But you have to understand that's against a very difficult comparison. So comps were up 9% in the first quarter of last year, up 27% on a two-year stack basis, up 93% on a three-year stack basis. Most retailers, if they could put up a positive comp against a 93% three-year stack, they would be dancing in the streets. The second thing is that, you know, they did um, reiterate their guidance for the full year, and they expect to do five, four to five percent comp store sales growth. This is a company that has a long history of beating consensus numbers. So yeah. I really do believe that uh, last week's sell-off was overdone, and that's why I flipped back to the buy rating. All right, fair enough. So that's kind of the, the story from inside the company. I'm curious about what's going on outside the company, meaning economic conditions and whether you have any concern here uh, about the pace of consumer spending and whether that uh, potential slowdown in consumer spending could affect Ulta. So, I mean, we still see the uh, U.S. consumers being fairly strong, right? You just had this very strong employment uh, re uh, report last week. Unemployment actually dipped down. Um, wage growth was over 4%. Again, that's, it's been over 4% year over year for more than two and a half years. The last, you know, 10, 11 months, uh, that has been higher than the rate of inflation. So consumers' purchasing power is improving. The other thing I always say about beauty products is they're far less discretionary um, than I think a lot of investors realize, particularly for Alta's core beauty enthusiast customer. There's a lot of things she's going to give up before she's going to give up uh, her makeup. Yeah, what am I going to say, Romaine? 
Huh? Invest in your face. That's what invest I'm going to say. Invest in your face. This yeah. is, this and is you're a, talking to two people in television here, Anthony. Yeah, yeah. So, we we so, invest in yeah. our face. We understand. Um, Anthony, just to take us back to last week, the drop in the stock was just so dramatic. What did we learn about that reaction uh, function in the market for these guys? So I think, look, I think part of it was, I mean, it was legitimate, right? I mean, they were at this conference and they talked about slowing industry sales. They talked about increased competition. But I think part of it, too, was the fact that you just had had PVH, um, you know, basically disappoint as well. And so I think there was some concerns about, you know, what does it say about the U.S. consumer? Now, I, I don't cover PVH, and I, from what I understand, a lot of their uh, issues were in Europe. Um, but, I, but I can uh, certainly understand uh, investors just, you know, sort of getting nervous and sort of selling the stock first and asking questions later. What other stocks, uh, competitors of Ulta, do you think are unfairly beaten up at this point? If you think that, you know, like Romaine and I will invest in our face and we'll pair other spending before that. Well, you know, I mean, look, there, there certainly are other, um, you know, stocks that are that are levered to beauty. Um, when you think about like an LVMH, mm -hmm. for example, um, you know, or, or an Estee Lauder. Um, you know, but but we're not as close to those stocks, so I'm not you know uh, I'm not necessarily going to make a big call on those stocks. I'm more focused on on Alta because look, one of the th reasons that we are very comfortable with Alta, um, get, you know, after the sell off is that they did talk about the fact that there is going to be product newness rolling out as the year progresses, and they're very excited about that. The first thing they talked about was Wind Beauty, so that Serena Williams line. There's a lot of newness coming out, uh, and one thing that they told me was that they think that the newness will uh, be more impactful in 2024 than it was in 2023. So that's very, you know, sort of idiosyncratic to, to Alta. Really cool stuff. Anthony, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Anthony Tacumba joining us from Loop Capital Markets. Interestingly enough, I have to be honest, my personal makeup stash, I buy from Instagram, different yeah. ads on Instagram. Just uh, saying. This is the only thing that I do buy from Instagram. Yeah, but it gets, I, I, learned something. I mean, we've heard this before, this idea that a lot of this stuff isn't as discretionary yes. to, to make it out to be. People want to look good. And of course, even when times are bad, it's sort of those little luxuries that sort of keep you uh, from, I guess, uh, losing your head. Yep. You know what's also not discretionary? What's that? Eclipse glasses, apparently. And you can go to public libraries and get them. Did yeah, you know there this? was, well, in my neighborhood this morning, there was literally a line down the block uh, no around the corner for uh, to get those free glasses. But look, I mean, this is the thing that's sweeping across the country, sweeping across uh, North America, we should say overall. Of course, we got the totality already down there uh, in uh, Mexico, and it's already starting to move uh, up through uh, Texas and into some of the other states. We're now actually starting to see it now. I'm not exactly sure what city we're, we're looking at right now I out in Vermont. That. Vermont. Uh, okay. So we're almost there. Alex, I mean, you see just a little bit of sliver of the sun, but oh, this is a big deal. I know a lot of people are like, oh, it's just, you know. I have to moon. say, by like 10 o'clock, I was I was eclipsed out already. Uh, really? However, when we started to see the moon come with the sun and we took on the glasses and I saw it out the window, I was like, okay, that's pretty cool. This is really great. We're going to have to wait, I think, 20 more years for a lower 48 yeah. lunar eclipse. There we go. Yeah. That's amazing. That's the totality right there. Absolutely beautiful. And when we come back, we're actually going to talk to somebody, a real pioneer in this. She calls herself an eclipse junkie, has been teaching this to kids. <laughs> I think she's seen something mm -hmm. like 17 uh, straight, uh, 17 eclipses overall in her life, total eclipses, I should say. Uh, I'm not sure all in a row there. But the idea that you have so many people out there that devote their lives to this. And, amazing. Uh, you know, when, when I found out about her, I found out about this other guy who apparently just devoted his life to this. Like he saw his first eclipse in the 70s when he was a small child and then just decided that this was like, it was life changing for him, and he became a scientist. And he basically has just spent, you know, the last, you know, six years of his life chasing these things. And amazing. you know, it's 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 amazing. And there are real tangible effects to this too. I mean, I know we all just joke about, you know, all, you know, it throws off the birds and the dogs and other things. I don't in know nature. about the dogs, but well, aren't yeah. like all the raccoons supposed to come out here in New York know. City I, for like the, the the ten minutes or I so? I feel like there were a lot of start. segments on lots yeah. of news channels about that. But <laughs> but to your point, because we're Bloomberg, we like all the angles. Yeah. And like I liked the one where X amount of solar power was going to be a canceled out, yeah. uh, which was, I thought was quite interesting. We're all prepared for it, right? Like nothing was going to happen on the grid, but that was interesting. And then different states in terms of the economic boom. Did you see that Airbnb chart? Yes. That yes. was amazing. Well, well, that's the other thing. I mean, you think about just the, the tourism angle to this and how many people have flocked uh, to places in Texas. Uh, even our, we should point out, our executive producer right now decided not to come in today. He traveled up He's to right Vermont. There. He's, He's right there. 
Right. He's looking at that this. right now. You know, and these <laughs> people are spending money. They're they're checking into hotels or buying memorabilia. This is a, a huge deal. I mean, we had footage a little bit earlier of how the Indi Indianapolis Speedway had basically just been uh, sold out, so people can come there. So you have venues making money off this. Uh, you know, it, it's it's you know, it's a thing. It, it is a thing. Yeah. But imagine if you did all of that and then it was cloudy. Like, wasn't it cloudy in Texas or something? It was cloudy like, the in some wasn't cities, the best? and you know, they said you know some people had to wait for the clouds to part, and then they came back. But you know, that's just kind of the nature of it. But it's also an experience, right? You're out there with yes. your friends and your family. And I know my family is actually out here in New York uh, going to see it. I guess you don't get the same effect as being in, in uh, Texas or somewhere else. But, you know, it's an experience. Yeah. You, have you ever seen one of these before? I have not. No? No. I saw one as a child. When I remember I was like, in school mm -hmm. and they all, you know, took us out into the yard uh, at school at and, and we saw it. And you know, I, I can't remember. I don't want to say what year it was. I was going to say what, what year was it? Because then you'll, <laughs> you'll know how old I am. It was back in the 40s. Uh, no, really, well, you back know, there the was 40s, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the the pre-war days. Uh, uh, now, I wonder where, if this is the other side of Vermont in totality or if this is maybe New York. I don't know. We're going to have to see. I don't know. We're not sure. And it's interesting, too, you brought up the, the solar power. Yes. And there was a great story. Of course, being Bloomberg, of course, we always have to uh, Maine, look at that's it. That's Maine, by the way. In the Maine. There you go. Um, uh, and I was shutting down, you know, so many gigawatts of, of power for only a brief time. I mean, nothing, you know, it's not like the, the electric grid is somehow going to collapse, but it is kind of an interesting a footnote to all of this. No, I like that. It was uh, the U.S. will lose about 30 gigawatts, to your point, yeah. roughly the output of 30 nuclear reactors. Uh, as sunlight is blocked during prime time and generating hours. So, right, we're prepared for it. The grid's fine. We can do it. But, like, the, the unintended consequences that you think of, you don't think of that when it comes to, say, like, natural gas or coal or nuclear, right? Like, the, this is a very particular circumstance where this will Very happen. particular. They also talked about how the temperature drops. You some might get, like, a 10 degree or so drop. Uh, oh, really? I didn't hear that. Just, yeah, for only the four minutes or so or whatever, how long the, really the moon is blocking the sun. But uh, it gives you a sense of what's going on. Well, speaking of then, as we... Ooh, as we look at these unbelievable, wow. beautiful pictures here of the total eclipse. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, this is a NASA telescope, of course. We want to talk to someone who just went through it. Uh, Julie Fine is our Texas Bureau Chief, uh, and she joins us now. Um, Julie, what was it like down there? Like, talk about, do the Bloomberg angle for us. <laughs> Okay, well, let's start with the financial angle. Uh, we had an economist estimate that this would bring $400 million plus into Texas alone. So that can show you how many people traveled here. And we saw, we walked down to the park here downtown to watch it right outside of our offices. It was absolutely packed, almost elbow to elbow as people went out there to watch this. It was a sight. I mean, it really was. I've seen a partial eclipse before living here, but it really, it gets, I mean, you see the video, but it really gets dark for a short period of time. So, you know, it was very exciting to be part of. It was interesting. You know, you see all the food trucks on the side of the road. You see people with glasses, eclipse sweatshirts. I almost felt like <laughs> for a moment that I was at a tailgate. I really <laughs> did. I felt like I was at a tailgate, but I mean, Financially, this is definitely a boon to the Dallas area where the mayor thought that he estimated that about 400,000 people were here. So obviously wow. financially very good for the area. Um, Julie, we're looking at current, we, we just saw a picture of uh, where we were in Texas in terms of the moon kind of passing uh, past the solar eclipse. Um, were there any issues when it comes to like the solar generation? Like how did Texas consider handling the power grid in that? Texas is one of the biggest producers of solar in the country. It is one of the biggest producers. There were preparations made. Um, there were, you know, there were questions about the grid. Obviously, this is a state that has present trouble with the power grid in the past. And it's really been solar in some cases that have that has saved the day. But there were no issues. Everything was fine. Again, it was just under four minutes, but there were no issues. And this gets uh, to the broader question, Julie. Is there a sort of, when you've talked to local officials or anything, is there any sort of follow through on this, the idea that they could kind of capitalize on this, what is effectively a one day and, if you will, just basically a four minute event here? Is there any, is there any life, I guess, beyond Eclipse Day? I think what the life is, is that the city is in the spotlight in a way that it hasn't been before. And I mean, so far, it was about an hour ago, there were no issues. All of the law enforcement was able to get through. You know, you saw fire trucks going through. So there were no major problems so far. There were no major problems with traffic. There were no major problems getting people back and forth. So, so far, again, with no major issues in such a big event, it really becomes something to celebrate for local officials.
All right, Julie Fine, our Texas Bureau Chief there, giving us uh, an update here on what she saw a little bit earlier, of course, at Texas, uh, one of the first places, at least here in the U.S., the continental U.S., where folks got a really good look at this. And our next guest, uh, she's seen a lot of these, at least 17 total solar eclipses in her lifetime. She calls herself an eclipse junkie. <laughs> and then, of course, in addition to that, she's a professor of physics and astronomy at Rice University. She's also the associate director for outreach programs at, at the Rice Space Institute, a world leader in space-related research and development. Really, really happy to have uh, Professor Patricia Reif here on the program. Pat, great to have you here. Uh, this is, uh, for many of us, the first time we've ever even laid eyes on this. You've seen 17 of these, and I know part of that is your job, but you didn't start watching this because of your job. What, what sort of fascinated, what sort of drew you in to this world of watching eclipses? My first total eclipse was in 1979 when I went to to Canada with the Johnson Space Center Astronomical Society. And they asked me if I would man the, the, the camera to look for comets, because back then we didn't have a space-based telescope to look for comets near the sun. Uh, unfortunately, the clouds didn't, didn't uh, work out. So uh, we, we did get to see the totality, but we didn't get to see any comets. But I was definitely hooked. And so <laughs> I've been eclipse chasing ever since. So this is my 18th. Uh, totality. Oh uh, plus, I've done three annulars, and unfortunately, we got mostly clouded out here in Bandera at the Flying Owl, but it got dark and we had a great time. I, I am curious, uh, just from a scientific perspective, I mean, we talk about the moon going past, sort of blocking out the light here. Are there any, I mean, I understand that in the moment, this creates some sort of disruptions in our environment. We talk about obviously solar panels and stuff that aren't gonna be charging for those few minutes, but are there any other sort of material things that happen during this time that we should be paying attention to? Well, uh, one of the science that we do is to look at the middle corona. We can see the inner corona from ultraviolet light emission from heavy ions in the, in the sun's near vicinity. And we can see the outer corona from our coronagraphs in space. But that middle corona, we really only see uh, during eclipses. And so it, it still has some science utility. The other thing we can do uh, is to monitor the ionosphere. When the sunlight goes away, our ionosphere disappears. And, and so that's another research project that's still very active during eclipses. Yeah, I'm looking at another feed from the International Space Station, and it's totally bizarre to look at that in the middle uh, of an eclipse. Um, Professor, what, what are there's, how does one become an eclipse junkie? So you saw your first one, and then over time, like what does each one wind up teaching you? Well, each one's different. Some happen in the daytime, some at night, some in the evening, none at night. I well, actually did have one at night in Antarctica. We were there in December and it was 3.30 a.m. local time, but it was a midnight sun. So we, we had an eclipse at 3.30 in the morning, but most of the time it's in the daytime. But each one is different. Like the circumstances are different. The clouds are different. Uh, and so, and your, your friends are different. So each time you're sharing this experience, which is a whole body experience, it's not just your eyes, it's your skin, it's your ears, it's everything uh, that is reacting uh, to the changes around you. And so it's fun. I like to say it's the, the most adrenaline you can get without being in the actual danger. Okay, fair enough, just as long as you have your, your glasses on. Um, what else do you think that scientists, uh, well, and yourself, hope to learn uh, from the eclipse this time? Well, the two main projects that I'm working on, one is called Citizen Kate, and we have 35 telescopes along the center line from Del Rio all the way to Maine, and trying to uh, monitor changes in this middle corona that's not visible to us any other way, uh, in polarized light. So we can see the changes in the magnetic structure of that middle corona. And that middle corona, when it launches a coronal mass ejection, can affect space weather here on Earth. So understanding how reconnection of those magnetic fields in that middle corona happen is really important scientifically, even though we only get, you know, an hour's worth of data. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, sometimes that can be a lot, particularly in the field that you're in, Patricia. And you go back to, uh, you know, the, the 70s when you saw your first one here. When you talk about what science scientists have learned over the years and decades from uh, watching these eclipses here, uh, has the technology that we use uh, to monitor and collect data on this, how much has that improved from the 70s to where we are today? Oh, absolutely. There's just no question. Uh, the, the telescopes that we use are better. Uh, Citizen Cake, for example, is using polarized light, so we can tell the direction, the local direction of the magnetic field. Uh, the uh, GPS uh, sounding of the ionosphere, we can have a, a group of stations all stretch out all across the country, and by looking where you get reflected radio signals, you can ascertain the density of the ionosphere and how it has changed uh, as that uh, that shadow goes off. And the other really important thing about eclipses crossing the United States is that we can mobilize thousands of observers along the path. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we have an eclipse in you know Libya or something, we might only get two or three observing areas. Yeah. But this way, we get spread out our observers all along the path and really improve our knowledge of the sun and its effects. All right, that's nice. And I have to ask you, uh, Professor, uh, this stuffed animal you have around your neck, is there any sort of meaning to that? Is that related okay. to the eclipse? Yes, see, this is Trigger. He has been with me on quite a number of eclipses, <laughs> including a couple of flat of that. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, he's also been on a couple of high altitude balloon flights. Okay. Uh, he's been 1,000 feet twice. And his twin brother went on the space station with Shannon Walker uh, as part oh. of Crew One. <laughs> wow. So he's, he's, he's been my high flying uh, companion uh, over the years. Oh, that's sweet. It looks like Trigger's uh, lived a more exciting life than most of us. And of <laughs> so course, uh, Professor, you have had an incredible life and you've done some great work. And we really appreciate you uh, taking time to share this uh, with us today. Professor Pat Reif over at Rice University. Um, that was very nice. I, I was kind of looking. I was staring at that thing the whole time. I was like, is there some significance? Good call. That? I thought it was yeah. a really big mic and part of her shirt. Yeah, so no, clearly your eyes are better. Uh, but that's just sweet. <laughs> than I, and, and I, and I kind of love that. I mean, one thing I've learned from this whole experience is the days leading up to this are just how many sort of eclipse nerds are out there <laughs> and the experience that they have. And they share these experiences. They talk about, oh, I cried the first time I saw one. Or I had this type of out-of-body experience. And you just, you know, I don't know. I feel like one day maybe I should just go out to Antarctica or wherever she said she was a few yes, months ago. Totally. Now, maybe not at 3.30 in the morning. But, you know, That's what you got to do in Antarctica, yeah. yeah. But instead, we're here, we're reporting the news for you. All Suffice right. it to say, volume's really light right now in the equity market. That might be an understatement here. <laughs> we are going to talk a little bit more about the markets as we count you down to the close, because believe it or not, the solar eclipse is having an effect on that. Look around your office if you're actually in the office today. Nobody's there, because they're all out watching the eclipse. Volumes are down. We're going to talk about it in our Stock of the Hour next with Abigail Doolittle. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. All right, welcome back. We've talked about how the solar eclipse is maybe affecting the economy, maybe affecting nature, affecting the solar grid. What about stocks? Apparently, there's an effect there, too. Abigail Doolittle joining us right now for a very special solar eclipse edition of Stock of the Hour. Yeah, well, you know, my notes here for this uh, segment, Eclipse. It's probably going to be the only time I'll ever have that title for any of the notes. You know, it's interesting because, of course, you want to look at our volumes affected, our stocks affected. Right now, we basically have stocks doing nothing. Volumes 15 percent below the 20-day average. So I would say if there is any sort of effect, it might be the effect that I just experienced. I was just up on floor eight with okay. Nora Melinda, who covers real estate mm -hmm. on the print side. Uh, and and we watched the peak, and there were people on the other building cheering. Everybody was cheering, peak eclipse. So I think that, <laughs> so, I love so that. nobody was working. Nobody was you were working. At that we moment. were working. I rushed back down here to talk about that. And that might be the effect, but I would say uh, correlation does not mean causation. Absolutely. And also, we have CPI on Wednesday, right? Yes, PPI on point. Thursday. So I'm also wondering, like, how much positioning won't be had uh, into that? Yeah, that's a good point. People wanting to know, uh, wait for that data because it could be significant given the fact that we have had. And what we're looking at here, that's the 
below average uh, volume of, to the 20 day, 20 day average. Uh, but people will want to know that information. So a little bit on hold given the fact that we've had some hotter inflation data. If you guys recall though on Stock of the Hour uh, a few months ago or a few, maybe about a year ago, Kevin Kelly of uh, Kelly ETFs, he was talking about how traders trade off of the blue moon and then mm. other people trade off of Mercury retrograde. My yes. question is, do people trade off of this? Terrell Holt on our markets team, he made this great chart showing that a year after the total solar eclipses, yeah. stocks up like 10 or 20 percent a year later. So who knows? Maybe good energy going to stocks. Yeah, I remember that episode. Yeah, yeah it was, it was pretty Kelly. controversial. That was actually, actually, that was probably one of the best options, insights <laughs> that we had on this uh, program. Abigail, you're missing out. You need a whole program uh, just on how uh, the moon and the sun affects uh, God, uh, the, awesome. the, the stock market or something. Maybe there sure. is. All right, we'll be back in a moment. We are counting you down to the closing bell. A parting shot there as a total eclipse continues across North America. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. Ten minutes ago, Alex and I'm not sure what you're watching because there's nothing going on in the market today. There really <laughs> isn't. And there is some rotation yeah. within the equity market. Uh, you had S&P Tech was the worst performing sector. Now it's not the worst. Uh, you had S&P uh, Real Estate was also not doing well. And then now it's doing well. Go figure. But yields are higher. So the, everything just feels confusing to me. Like why would the real estate sector uh, be up? Utilities not be terrible if yields were also climbing. It feels a little bit of a hodgepodge. Yeah, maybe some distortions right now in the price action mm -hmm. given lower volume. And of course, some folks kind of waiting to see what those inflation reports say uh, on Wednesday and Thursday before making any big bets going forward. As traders await that big U.S. CPI print this week, we did have a chance to catch up with the head of global inflation market strategy at Barclays, Michael Pond, who shared his expectations. The Fed has In been trying to achieve yeah. uh, uh, what's been known as a soft landing. Mm -hmm. For uh, So far, we've had no landing. Mm -hmm where the economy just keeps chugging along. It's not, it had to, it's certainly well off its highs. Mm -hmm. So inflation, you mentioned, was above 9%. We think on Wednesday, uh, head over, year over year headline comes in at mm -hmm. 3.4. So yeah. much lower, but it's, it's stalled out at a pretty strong level. And that was Michael Pond who helped kick us off to the close at the top of the hour. And as we get closer to those bells, Hank Smith joins us to get us to that finish line. He's head of investment strategy over at Haverford Trust. Hank, always wonderful to see you here. And we're starting the week here with, I guess, a little bit of, uh, I guess, a pause, if you will. But I think everybody is really looking ahead to some of those inflation prints and some of the other economic data, not to mention the start of an earnings season. We all forget about that, Hank. And I sort of wonder where you fall right now into the camp of where this market goes next. Is there really enough juice there? And is there going to be enough support from the economic and corporate fundamentals? Well, look, uh, we have had such a strong move off of uh, uh, since really October that the market is due for a pause, a pullback, a correction maybe. And that would actually be healthy. Bull markets have corrections every year. It's a normal part of the process. It helps cleanse some of the excesses in any areas of build up uh, speculation. I think we've seen a few uh, in this market this year when you know looking at Bitcoin uh, as an example. So. Um, a correction or just a, a pullback would not be a cause for concern, almost a cause for celebration. Intermediate long term were very constructive uh, on this market. And we think the market is is OK with inflation between two and a half and three and a half percent. The Fed's not because their credibility is at stake. But the stock market, um, as your previous guest noted, has come down well off its highs mm -hmm. and uh, I think the market, uh, it's been very good for the stock market. Do you worry at all that we might start to see a bit more of a divergence between the way equity investors see the market and the way fixed income investors see the market? And if so, is that going to matter? Well, um, look, um, I, I, I think that, one, we have been in the camp that whatever the terminal rate is, and we believe we're at the terminal rate, it's going to remain there much longer than market participants expect. And I think I think you're finally starting to see that in surveys and in the Fed funds futures. Uh, we're looking at one cut this year and maybe even no cut. Mm -hmm. And the primary reason is um, the Fed does not want to repeat the mistakes of the 70s where you had a series of start, go, start, go, start, go that resulted in inflation becoming very, very embedded. And of course, we had to have a double dip recession to 
deep recessions in order to rid those inflationary expectations. So the Fed doesn't want to make that mistake. And they have the luxury right now of a very strong economy. Mm -hmm. And look, we've had the manufacturing sector all of a sudden emerge out of 15 months in recessionary territory of uh, the ISM manufacturing uh, uh, survey. So we could be seeing the economy strengthen uh, from here if we get right. manufacturing and home building. So Hank, based on that, what is a good value right now versus what you need to wait for a pullback to buy? Yeah, so uh, we think uh, there is continued pent up demand, unleashing of pent up demand uh, in the medical um, area and particularly with medical pr procedures. So we like device makers like Stryker, like Medtronic uh, and J&J, &J. Medtronic and J&J &J particularly good values uh, in here. Uh, we also like the kind of onshoring, electrification of the U.S. economy, data center building, uh, that, that theme with names uh, like Envent, Eaton, Honeywell, um, hmm. and of course, uh, AI and AI productivity, and we own names like Microsoft, Oracle, and Accenture, which we think will benefit. Now, a caveat, uh, some of these stocks uh, have had uh, parabolic moves. And um, generally speaking, parabolic moves do not last forever. And you ha uh, have uh, steep pullbacks, corrections uh, in an ongoing bull story. So Eaton, for an example, uh, has had a parabolic move. And so we would just caution any new investors to be patient and allow for a pullback. Um, what about what do you do about the guys like NVIDIA, for example, um, that have had a tremendous run, right? They're delivering the numbers. Right. It's like you can't can't not own it, but then you can't buy it at this level. I mean, is that your derivative play? Is like that your Microsoft derivative play for that? Yeah, uh, and we also own ASML, mm. uh, which is another um, AI play, uh, and it too has had a pretty big uh, parabolic move. But I think with those moves, uh, history suggests that uh, stocks do not go up in a straight line. And I would remind viewers that it was only two years ago that uh, from the beginning of 22 to late October, NVIDIA was down over 70 percent. Um, uh, Meta was down over 80 percent. Uh, they have since made all that uh, back and then some. So even with the most bullish stories, and NVIDIA is a bullish story that has legs, I think you still need to be patient because stocks don't go straight up uh, for long periods of time. All right, Hank, always wonderful to talk to you. Hank Smith there. He heads uh, investment strategy over at Haverford Trust, helping us count down to the closing bells with just about uh, three minutes to go. And Alex, I mean, this has always been the big question, uh, what he was talking about at the end there, the idea of are we going to see really any kind of material rotation out of some of those big AI names, or is this really the trade? Yep, and is it going to yeah. be a rotation, or is it going to be and also by cyclicals? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the question, and I yeah. mean, we've gotten an answer a few times before, which is, well, anytime someone feels a little jittery, they just gravitate back to that. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I thought it was interesting, um, Michael Casper, talking about how cyclicals are going to come up against some tough comps too yes. later. Like we're expecting, OK, economy's holding in. You want to buy cyclicals. There's some value there. But then when you get the tough comps, maybe that means you're going to be disappointing when it comes to earnings and kind of when that moment happens. And it raises the question, too, as to when do we get a better, I guess, growth narrative, too? Because, you know, that, of course, that drives markets. That's why NVIDIA's up. It's not really about the money they're making today. It's about what right. everyone thinks they're going to make uh, down the road here. And if some of those smaller mid-cap names can put together some sort of growth story, we get that. Yep. And then you also get billions coming from the government to the likes of like TSMC, for example. And then there's that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we're moving closer to those closing bells. Full market coverage coming up in just a second as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. We're counting you down to the closing bell. You're here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast. We're joined right now by Scarlett Fu in our television studio, Carol Masser and Tim Stanovic in the radio booth. Welcome to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms here 
on this very special day, Carol Masser, yeah. which, as you know, is National Empanada Day. <laughs> <laughs> Not where I, I thought you, you were going to go. Yeah. I mean, I knew he wasn't going to go to the eclipse, but... How about the other E? Yeah, exactly. Romance. You know, Tim actually ran out of the studio to go check it out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was part of work. Uh, yeah, it was part of work. I did a hit from down there on uh, Lexington Avenue and 58th Street. Yeah. Did you really? Um, yeah, yeah. I did. It was great. Using yeah. a phone. Using the phone. And Zoom. Zoom. It's this oh. new thing. I feel I don't like know. we missed a trick there. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I feel like we should have yeah. done wow. that. Hey. Yeah, look at okay. that. That's initiative. Just next time. Come 20 years. Initiative. We'll make that happen in the next 20 years. <laughs> 20 years. Yeah. 2044. <laughs> I'll, I'll take we'll my walker there. out there. <laughs> I'm, I'm having trouble keeping my eyes open because I looked, I think, outside too long with the glasses what? on. What? No, 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 with the glasses on. on. Okay. Right. But now I feel like everything is a little too bright, a little bit too, you know, weird. And it's probably just my mind playing tricks on me. Here, I have some eye drops there. I was using some too. So I just gave her some eye drops. Yeah, okay. just hanging on. Uh, but I don't know if you guys looked at uh, the volume. I mean, it was just kind of sad. It, clearly, Everybody no was one was trading. The they were all watching the stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, that, we were talking to Abigail too, a little a little earlier, and she was providing a lot of anecdotes. Yeah, and nobody's around. I feel like everybody's off work today, or at least chose to take off work. Or if you're like, like Tim, you just go wandering the streets of Manhattan. I checked with my boss. He said it was okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was approved. It was approved. All right. Well, the price action might have been tepid, but we always have to walk you through. Look, even the clapping is kind of tepid. Right? There's like, like four people there. Yeah, they're, they're all like, like why are we here? We missed the eclipse for this. Or, uh, nevertheless, I'm sure they're all happy to be there. Uh, ringing the bell here uh, on this uh, Monday uh, afternoon. I'm not sure where the folks on the left there are, but uh, interesting uh, price action in the market today with the Dow Jones Industrial Average. We're just going to call it unchanged. It is in the red, down about 11 points. That's only a fraction of a fraction of a percent. The S&P also down only about two points on the day. The Nasdaq higher by five points on the day. If you haven't fallen asleep My yet, God. here's some action for you. The Russell 2000, a five-tenths of a percent cool. gain on the day. There you go. <laughs> yeah, this is a bit of a snoozer. I'll see you guys Wednesday. Sure. How about that? <laughs> Deal. Well done. Hey, well, that's all, that's for our dozens okay. of viewers out there right now. It shows <laughs> To people, stick with us. People <laughs> care. Thank you for sticking along. All right, the S&P 500. So what does it mean? 286 names gaining in this uh, Monday mellow session. Uh, 215 scarlet to the downside, two unchanged. Yeah, and when you look at the sector breakdown, six groups in the red. Uh, Five groups in the green, but um, two groups little change. That's communication services and materials. Your best performers are REITs, consumer discretionary, thanks to Tesla and utilities. The laggards here are energy, healthcare, and tech. No eclipse in the IMAP, huh? No, That's it's, it's kind of messy. All right, let's get to some of the individual gainers. Tesla, number one gainer in the NASDAQ 100, number four gainer in the S&P 500. Elon Musk promising again that a robo-taxi is coming this time in August. Uh, investors jumping on board the name, the stock. Uh, Finishing off its highs of the session, but still just shy of a 5% gain in today's session. Keep in mind, Elon Musk has been talking about one uh, for years, and it's coming at a time where we know Tesla shares are one of the worst performing names in the S&P 500, down about 30% here. Uh, and so just kind of interesting to see investors kind of like it and jumping on board in this kind of mellow day and mellow session, low volume session. Um, GE, uh, Renova, this was your number two gainer in the S&P 500, and this one was up just about 6% in today's session, uh, catching its first upgrade quickly from the Wall Street community. J.P. Morgan analyst Mark Strauss upgrading uh, shares of the power generation company to the equivalent of buy from hold, kept a $141 a share price target. Uh, GE Vernova closing at just under $130 a share in today's session. Uh, you might remember Vernova and uh, GE Aerospace completed their separation. That was on April 2nd, with GE Vernova having a very volatile first week of trading, but nonetheless, investors liking uh, that that upgrade. And Why didn't they just call it Vernova? I, it's I agree. Confusing, this GE Vernova. Don't you think they're going to drop it at one point? I mean, they have to. Because every time you start talking, I think you're talking about GE. And I, I, Vernova. I know. I'm trying. I know. I know. All right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not your fault. No, no to the. Uh, um, what is it? The, uh, the, the, the consultancies, yeah, right? Guys, yeah. The consultant community, right? Who are like, keep the GE thing. Um, all right, let's get to uh, apartment income REIT. Uh, we had to do this one. Uh, this one was up 22%. Had to do after Blackstone agreed to buy it. Uh, it's an apartment buildings owner, $5.5 billion market cap, at least as of today. Uh, they bought it for $39.12 a share, so the stock closing at $38.38. So a little bit of deal flow on this Monday. All right, how about some of the decliners, starting with the worst performer on a percentage basis in the S&P 500? That goes to 
to uh, Paramount Global. We're continuing to watch what's going on with Paramount and Skydance. We're actually going to have Lucas Shaw join us in just a few minutes uh, to explain the latest there, but down 7.6% uh, today. Uh, Matrix Asset Advisors has raised concerns over a proposal that would see Paramount Global sell its voting stock and then merge with David Ellison's production company, Skydance Media. Uh, also keep an eye on shares of Uber, which ended up closing uh, lower today by 2.76%. Uh, you heard Carol talk about uh, Elon Musk's robo-taxi, which is going to be unveiled uh, in August. Uh, the company has said that the platform will be a cheaper car, robo-taxi. Uh, you know, it kind of makes sense that a company like Uber potentially would fall on a day like today. Uh, the concern, I guess, is that if there are robo-taxis available at your beck and call, you won't necessarily call Uber. We should note that Uber did have a self-driving division, the um, Advanced Technologies Group, ATG. They sold that back in 2020, uh, but they've invested in the company that they sold it to. So they still have a stake when it comes to uh, self-driving. Uh, and then DJT, uh, Trump Media and Technology Group. Do you want to look at this one? Closing today down by, uh, yeah, about, is that 5% or 8%, guys? Maybe I was looking at the eclipse too long. Eight, 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 thank you. Eight yeah, 8.4%. It's kind of um, hard from here. It's far. We're going to switch studios at some point. Um, it's Hell? wiped out uh, several billion dollars uh, in value uh, just in the last few days. We have seen the market cap um, decline to roughly about $5 billion now, uh, even though it generates just $4.1 million uh, in revenue last year. So we're starting to see the stock come back to earth. We should note that it's still... Um, I think it's fair to say that analysts would argue that it's still not necessarily connected to any fundamentals right now. Yeah, potentially. You're not alone. I, I couldn't read the location indicator for any of the Eclipse stuff, so you're totally in good okay. company. Thank um, you, Okay, Alex. the bond market was actually kind of interesting. Um, you definitely had a sell-off. Bonds on offer in the front end pretty solidly. Uh, yields uh, up about four basis points. You also had a similar sell-off in the back end, but that reverse kind of middle of the day, a touch, a touch, a touch of buying uh, coming in. But I do think the conversation of does the 10-year hit five before three? is a legit one and not one that we would have had, say, just even a few weeks ago. Yeah, I mean, definitely so. I mean, everyone's saying that four or five in the line. It was interesting. We were speaking with, uh, uh, who was it, uh, Michael Pond a little yes. bit earlier at Barclays, and he actually sees this uh, bond sell-off continuing, and a couple other folks, Carol, that we've spoken to today yeah. also saying the same thing here. This is just the start. Well, listen, and this is where the CPI, mm. the PPI prints uh, this week, but CPI in particular on Wednesday, you know, whether or not we see uh, a hotter than expected or forecasted inflation print, whether or not, then they kind of, you know, we get to that 4.5 on that 10 year once again. Um, so kind of keeping an eye on all of that. Having said that, both you and I are, we all have stories about things going up in price. And this one that we caught our attention, Tim and my attention, has to do with uh, Stony Brook's Eastern Long Island Hospital. Uh, the chief administrative officer says it's kind of a challenging place to recruit because it's gotten so expensive to live. Uh, and they're talking about Greenport in Long Island, uh, in Long Island, sorry, I didn't mean to do that, in Long Island. <laughs> It's about it just came out naturally. <laughs> it's the New Jersey in me that came out. Um, anyway, huh? the median prices in the once affordable um, area now have jumped in f uh, four years 50% to almost a million dollars. So, and listings have declined about 60%. So, uh, they're seeing some pressure in trying to uh, attract doctors who make $350,000 or more. They can't even find a home. I mean, I think an important note in this story is that the governor did try to actually build, you know, make a rule change so more housing could be built in New York City suburbs to try to alleviate the housing crisis, of which this article certainly is part of. Um, but the folks who live in these areas were not fans of that change in zoning, that change in plan. So I, I would argue that until we see more homes built in a lot of these areas, the prices are going to keep going high because of supply and demand. Yeah, so Suffolk County, Nassau County, Westchester County are saying, nope, 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 not in my backyard. We don't want any more houses because that's going to affect our school district. That's going to affect our um, the value of our homes. And by the way, the kids, their kids, are going to be paying more than I don't know, by this point, $100,000 a year for college. Because right now, Ivy League schools cost more than $90,000 for annual tuition. It's bananas. Are the kids on the hook or are the parents on the hook? Depends. I think it depends. Um, <laughs> well, a kid can afford hook. that. So this article is actually uh, quite, I mean, it's something that we don't know, right? Like right. higher education is quite expensive. It does go into sort of what schools and how much they cost. Like UPenn, I think, topped the list over 92000 and that includes room and board. But uh, there are all these stipulations that if your family makes uh, less than a certain amount of year, it's totally free. So there are things like that. Less than uh, 60000 less than 75000 it's a far cry from a lot of the people who live in those neighborhoods that we're just talking about. Yeah, exactly. And sort of how, I mean, this isn't, it's been, yeah, how do you do that? How do you do that in a rational way?
And why does it keep going up so much? Why? Bigger question, right? Have you had some of the food at these schools? It's really good. <laughs> no. Michelin star chefs? Really? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, did I, I don't know I where the... I think I had a my waffle parents, machine My parents were school. always horrified when they came to visit me in college and how, like, how good the food was, how nice the dorms were, how nice the lawns were. And I think it was like, you know, this is where the money's going. Yeah, you're like, why are we paying all this for nice trees? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, guys. All right, that's a wrap. Our cross-platform coverage on this Eclipse Monday. Radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals, Beyond the Bell. We'll see you again, same time, same place tomorrow. All right, our coverage continues here on The Close. When we come back, we're going to take a closer look at what's been going on in the commodity space with gold at a record high and oil maybe potentially hitting $100 a barrel. There's a lot of concerns right now about supply shocks rattling the market. Rebecca Babbin going to be joining us in just a bit, senior energy trader at CIBC. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Romain Bostic here, the first trading day of the new week here. And well, actually not a lot going on. We're going to start with the bond market because we did see a continuation of that sell-off here on this day. That continued to push yields higher. And we had a chance to catch up with Michael Pond, who heads inflation strategy over at Barclays. And he says this is just actually the start of that global bond sell-off. Uh, Hank Smith over at Haverford Trust saying something similar, at least in the context of the Fed and rate cuts, saying his expectations for rate cuts is now this year now down to maybe just one and maybe even zero, and that's going to continue to put upward pressure on yields. 4.8 right now on your two-year yield. We're still at around 4.4 on the 10, but a lot of concern right now that we could creep up to 4.5. Bitcoin had a phenomenal day right now, holding at that 72,000 level. We're going to talk about this in just a second. Another phenomenal day for gold, back at a record high, but more importantly, the trading range was insane. It's actually third widest trading day that we've had for gold so far this year, and about the fourth or fifth widest trading day that we've had in about six or seven months. But I want to go back to the top of the screen here because that you can see just based on where the S&P closed today, there was not a lot going on. Volume about 10% below where it would normally be, at least across the entire tape. Now, Scarlett, there were a couple of interesting individual stories out there. You had some big declines mm -hmm. in names like Paramount and Meta and some big gains today in names like Tesla and Spirit Airlines. Absolutely. Let's start with Tesla because it was the biggest advancer in the Nasdaq 100, gaining almost 5% on the day. Now, this is fair Fairly unusual, at least this year, for Tesla to gain uh, at least four and a half percent. It's only happened three times in 2024. The catalyst for this big move today was Elon Musk on Friday, essentially distracting investors uh, from its recent sluggish delivery numbers by talking up a robo taxi. He po he posted on X that uh, Tesla will unveil a robo taxi in August. No details, no other details were really given. We're also keeping an eye on Spirit Airlines, uh, up almost seven percent on the day, and this after announcing extensive of cost cuts, including plans to push out next year's delivery of Airbus SE jets, uh, as well as planning to furlough 260 pilots. Uh, and of course, this comes after the government blocked its sale to JetBlue about three months ago because of antitrust concerns. Now, our top story this hour, one of our top stories this hour, is Taiwan Semiconductor getting a big assist from Uncle Sam as it ramps up advanced chip production here in the U.S. Meanwhile, you have the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen urging China to focus on boosting domestic demand rather than trying to export its way back to rapid growth. We're going to examine both angles of that. Romain? Absolutely here. We do want to go back, though, to some of the big price moves that we saw in this day, and it was not in the equity space. It was in gold, touching a fresh record above 2,350 an ounce ahead of that big March inflation data report this Wednesday. The gains are fueled by optimism that the Fed is getting closer to cutting rates. Joe Doe joining us right now. He covers metals and mining for us here at Bloomberg News. And uh, Joe, I am curious actually what's driving this, because in addition to just hitting the record high, I was looking at just how the price swings, and not just today, we've seen this in previous days, this goes beyond just the Fed, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so. My, yeah. my colleagues over the weekend wrote this really good story that was like, there's all these things happening, and it's not like they just started happening, yes. right? They've been out there for a while, but now the gold price is moving. And, and the first thing I think back to is the first time I wrote a gold story over 12 years ago, right? That was back when we had, you know, bond buying and mm -hmm. QE3 and whatever it was. And mm -hmm. the whole idea back then was, well, inflation's on the way and everything else, but this is a different time. I do think it is multiple factors. I do think the fact that, you, you th that people do feel like eventually... Um, 
you know, the Fed's going to start lowering rates. And so right. it's like, OK, well, where are we going to go? We're going to go to gold, which is non-interest bearing. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also continued concerns about the economy on the other side of the, that things may hit. So it does seem like a confluence of factors right now coming into play for gold. Not to mention geopolitical tensions rising as well. Yeah. Do you think there's any linkage here between Bitcoin doing really well and gold doing well? You know, we've had that conversation. I mean, there could be some of that. Certainly, like I said, 12 years ago, Bitcoin wasn't even a part of the discussion. Yeah. wasn't even in the nomenclature. Um, and it is traded differently, especially by currency traders. Uh, but, you know, I think, I think gold for itself, probably there's still more of a focus on the fundamentals that typically do impact gold. But I, but I don't think you can discount that either. What are analysts saying in terms of where they think gold prices will end the year? Is there as much division in their forecast as well? I think right now they're expecting you're just going to see gold go a little bit higher, right, with the expectation that the Fed at some point will cut. Even if we don't see a hard cut, there's, the, you know, people don't think we're going to see things going uh, decidedly higher. I think there's a general sense that, yeah, things are going to probably be where they're at, maybe a little bit higher. I mean, we did talk to one analyst who at the end of our story says, yeah, actually, I think we're going to see things cool off a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, but yeah, for now, it seems like gold's really riding, riding this wave. Absolutely. A wide trading range here on the day. Joe Doe covers this for us here at Bloomberg. We keep an eye on commodities on this day because we also had some interesting activity in the oil space. WTI crude up back below 87 bucks a barrel, but also a relatively wide trading range on the day, both for WTI and Brent. Rebecca Babin joining us right now. She's a senior energy trader at CIBC private wealth group and obviously one of our favorite people to talk about when we're trying to make sense of some of these moves. I mean, we're talking about geopolitics in the context of gold buying. How much of that is driving the geopolitics is driving uh, the moves that you've been seeing in crude oil? I would say the last five to ten dollars has been a fair amount of geopolitical risk being repriced into crude. When we initially had the attack on October 7th between Hamas and Israel, we saw a five dollar move in crude pricing in some geopolitical risk and potential supply disruption. That kind of got sucked out of the market as people realized supply isn't really at risk as, as long as that conflict is contained. Mm -hmm. What's happening now with the latest move by Israel to attack a um, a consulate in Iran mm. is this is reestablish that fear that this may escalate and draw Iran directly into this conflict. Mm. And in that case, you do actually see a higher degree of potential of supply being impacted. Well, so it's re kind of put that geopolitical risk back in. So, so that's the part that I, I'm curious about. I, I mean, in that hypothetical, where is that supply disruption? Are we talking about actual production? Are we talking about export routes being affected? What, what's the actual effect? That's a great question, yeah. and that's why we're not a lot higher than we are, because uh. the line of sight to a direct supply disruption mm. is a little murky. The way it plays out is maybe Iran gets drawn into the conflict and some of their production gets impacted as Israel potentially goes after their exports. Mm. The other way that it happens is supply routes are more impacted through the Red Sea. Right now, Russia is still able to move all their barrels through the Red Sea, right, because it's a kind of controlled chaos. You get a wider disruption out of the, out of Russia's no longer able mm. to ship. You get another kind of potential dis supply disruption there. Worst case scenario, and this is very low probability, Iran fully involved, full escalation. They potentially block the Strait of Hormuz. That's that's the very extreme outcome, very low probability. All right. Well, thank you explaining for explaining through those different possibilities. So you've got these increased geopolitical risks. You've also got an unexpected drop in Mexican exports. You've noted that. Normally, would that be a big deal on its own, or is it just because you've got the geopolitical angle tied to it that it, it's got people thinking? Great question. So normally it wouldn't be as big of a deal, but it's not necessarily the geopolitical risk that's hurting um, that potential pr supply disruption. It's the fact that those sour barrels are also being disrupted in Russia through the Ukraine drone attacks. So we've actually seen some of their refineries get hit, mm -hmm. cut a little bit of their heavier crude exports, making that impact of Mexican exports, which is heavy crude, have an outsized impact. Now, there is something to be said that Mexico has an election coming up, and some of their promises have been that they will keep more of their product internal, lower domestic prices. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a little bit of kind of posturing in this, and people think that these deep cuts that we've seen will actually start to get unwound as the after the election. So this may be a short-term disruption, but it's impacting the market, um, I'd say, to a fair degree at this point. Well, speaking of the election, there's going to be similar concerns here in the U.S. as well. And we already know that the U.S. has the option to perhaps release barrels from the SP. 
NPR. If that's already priced in, because it is an election year and we know that the White House wants to do what it can to reduce consumers' worries, would actually releasing barrels materially move the price since we know that it's probably going to happen? So I don't think it is priced in. I think people are talking about it being a potential, but since we've already drawn down so much of the SPR, 180 million barrels in our last release, and we're at a low level, there's kind of this, will he push the envelope I to see. do more? And he can only, Biden, the Biden administration can only do between 30 and 50 million barrels on this next release, far less than he was able to do when we had the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which was a true supply disruption. He'd be relying on doing an exchange to get these barrels out. So I think the market's a little hesitant to price that in. But I think what is going to happen is OPEC is price thinking, I don't want to be behind an SPR release like I was in 2022. Because guess what? I haven't brought a barrel back in years. I've been still cutting. So if SPR is coming, I'm coming first. I'm not going to be aggressive. But my goal as OPEC is to maintain control of the market, yeah. not to lose it to the SPR. Oh, all this game theory. Rebecca, really appreciate your joining us this afternoon. Rebecca Babin is senior energy trader at CIBC Private Wealth Group. Coming up on the close, we're going to take a look at the top three. We focus in on some of the top movers and shakers at the center of the day's biggest stories. This is Bloomberg. Earnings season is coming. I think we're all asking the same question. Just how much earnings growth they're expecting. Bloomberg is first to break the numbers. Gilead is coming out right now. We have take two numbers. Shares of Pinterest. Lucid Group coming out with its earnings. All eyes right now on NVIDIA. A lot still to come. With the smartest insights. How much bigger could profit and revenue have been? Better than what the street was expecting. Bang in line with estimates. We will have full and instant analysis. It all starts Friday on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. Time now for the top three, where we name drop the people driving some of the day's most talked about stories. And first up is Elon Musk. He was talking with one of Tesla's biggest shareholders, Norges Bank Investment Management CEO Nikolai Tangen on X Spaces. And he began the live discussion talking about how well the service worked. And then, of course, right around then, the service went out, the audio cut, and then it happened two more times. So technical difficulties got in the way of uh, what Elon Musk was trying to really talk up here. Yeah, never a dull moment. Uh, did we learn anything? Did he like unveil a new like mm. robo car or robot? He talked up a lot of something? things like AI, the inevitability uh, of EVs, uh, yeah. his ambitions for X, you know, the usual. All right. Well, the usual. We actually got a little bit of the usual out of someone else, and that was Jamie Dimon. He came out with his annual letter, mm -hmm. and it includes a lot of the usual stuff, his takes on the economy and such, but he actually spent a lot of time uh, talking about AI and the disruptive nature of it, how it's even disrupting his own company, in some ways good, but uh, I was more interested and just how much real estate he devoted yeah. to this topic. Yeah, he said that J.P. Morgan has identified more than 400 use cases for AI across different parts of the business, mm -hmm. whether it's marketing, fraud, and risk. So he sees huge potential in how it's going to change the business over time. Yeah, he says the consequences of this are just going to be extraordinary. Transformational, I think, was the word he used. Transformational, yes, yes. Uh, and I think everyone's been saying that, but to hear it out of somebody like him in his mouth, it, I think adds a little more credence. I mean, Jamie's not shy about giving us opinions about the future. So No, he's not. Yeah. He also says, by the way, that the market is too complacent about a soft landing, but that's a separate conversation for landing. another day. Well, well, that was the usual stuff. I was trying to ignore <laughs> that stuff, <laughs> Scarlett. <laughs> All right, the last person that we're watching is Dawn Staley. She's the head coach of the South Carolina Gamecocks, which ended its season undefeated with a 38-0 record. South Carolina defeated Caitlin Clark's Iowa in the women's NCAA basketball final by a score of 87 to 75. So storybook ending here, Romaine. Yeah, I mean, this was everybody. I mean, Dawn Staley, obviously a legend. I think everybody, well, everyone was for Caitlin Clark, but if you weren't rooting for Caitlin Clark, definitely yeah. Dawn Staley you this to happen and, and her, her folks and her team are, are really the ones. Yeah, I mean, it was nice to see. I mean, I, I have to say, though, uh, can we just say, at least for me, this was probably one of the most exciting women's final, uh, yeah. women's tournaments, yes. NCAA tournaments, from start to finish, from the first round to the last round that I've seen in years. I mean, it was just thrilling all around, and not just because of Caitlin Clark. I mean, we had just so many great stories, even the UConn women. Yeah. I, I was kind of sad. I was kind of rooting for them to, to, to go all the way, but, you know, I guess the men get their shot later tonight. 
Exactly. Yeah. My, my question is for someone like Don Staley, what happens next? Will any men's program try recruiting her? Would the NBA try recruiting this her? This has been like the big question, right? Because you have so many, I don't say so many, but there's like five or six really great women coaches that you look at and you think they could coach yes. men yes. in the NBA. And they should be. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see if that ends up being in the cards for her. She certainly uh, earned it, uh, to say uh, the least. All right, coming up, we've got college basketball madness. Uh, March Madness wraps up with tonight's men's final game in April. We're going to speak with Mark Douglas. He's president and CEO of Mountain about whether ad revenue this year was a slam dunk or not. Did the women's games get more money? Not clear. We'll talk. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, college basketball fans here in the U.S. will tune in tonight to the men's final between the Purdue Boilermakers and the UConn Huskies. It's sure to generate a lot of water cooler buzz and a whole lot of money. Here in the studio with us for more is Mark Douglas. He's the president and CEO of the advertising platform Mountain. Mark, great to have you here. You too. And, and we should just point out, too, I mean, we're going to talk a little bit about the game yeah. tonight. But really, this whole tournament on both the men's and women's side has just been exhilarating. And I want to start with the women because that was the big game last night. Absolutely. Uh, I haven't seen the ratings for that yet, but the ratings from Friday, I know, broke a gazillion records right. by a mile here. Yeah. Obviously because of Caitlin Clark, but also really just because of the whole tenor of this tournament. Yeah. And I don't know if something has changed other than just the appearance of Caitlin Clark on the scene or if there's just more of an embrace, not only by fans, but by advertisers of the women's game than what we've seen in the past. Yeah, I, I think what happened yeah. is it became a story that's a bit bigger than sports. Mm -hmm. And so that just brought not only brought in a new people into the into the environment, essentially, but then it dragged along mm -hmm. all the sports fans who maybe weren't paying attention to women's basketball mm -hmm. and all of a sudden realized there's 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 some serious talent there. from an advertising perspective does it a marketing perspective does this kind of become kind of that michael jordan moment when you go back in the early in the nba back in the yeah. 80s and jordan came on the scene and he brought in a lot of people to the game yeah. who had no interest in basketball yeah. no interest in sports but they wanted to see greatness yeah. and that just set a huge platform not just for michael jordan himself and the bulls but for really every player that came after yeah him. i mean i think you more use the analogy of the williams sisters oh, bringing okay. what yeah. they brought mm -hmm. to tennis yeah. a little bit of tiger woods brought to golf where mm -hmm. people who really weren't big fans of the game all of a sudden appreciated the level of play mm -hmm. and a bit of the fairy tale of mm -hmm. it all to have kind of people on the scene that just like exhilarated the fan base and then you know the advertisers go wherever the wherever the eyeballs yeah. are is where the advertisers yeah, yeah. follow. So I'm curious, did the women's game steal marketing dollars from the men's game in any way, given that you had these matchups between, you know, South Carolina, Iowa, once again, after last year, Iowa kind of devastated South Carolina. I mean, there are a lot of things that, you know, in terms of storylines, you couldn't have come up with a better one if you yeah. if you wanted to. Well, pro probably not. And the reason why is because I think in the men's game, most advertisers already had that kind of baked into the cake. They mm -hmm. knew they wanted to be there and they committed to it. Like, you know, people hear the phrase up front, they committed to that in advance. So if I think for the women's game, that was just something that probably came on very, very quickly. And and the advertisers, they'll find the money. You know, where, wherever there's a fairy tale, they will show up and, and be there. State Farm has been particularly good at oh, that yeah. this year, just kind of arriving on the scene at the right moment in sports. Will they show up again next year or will they show up at the WS? NBA where Caitlin Clark is expected to play? Well, certainly the WNBA. I think, you know, getting those games to get more visibility is probably going to actually happen also. Um, the college basketball, I think they'll be there, but some player is going to have to step up to keep them there. And, and I, you know, those players, I think, exist. And, and the college game, people love. Once you leave New York City, places like that, people love college sports. Yeah, and for a lot of people, that's all they have. Oh, exactly. And some of those places. Exactly. And, and you talk about the money generated. There's been a lot of discussion about just how much uh, money uh, Caitlin Clark made and, yeah. and name and image likeness, and for that matter, Angel Reese and some of the other yeah. uh, big players from this tournament. But to Scarlett's point, as these two players transfer presumably into professional yeah. basketball, whether it's in the WNBA or somewhere else here. What does that advertising and more importantly, their sponsorship 
end up looking like? Are we going to talk about these sort of mega long-term deals, or are these going to be sort of one-off, one-off here? I think it's very probable. I mean, shoe deals, like all of that seems to be possible to come her way, Mm -hmm. and also hopefully create a halo effect for other players already at that level Mm -hmm. who maybe weren't getting enough attention. She broke not only the scoring record for the women's game in Mm -hmm. college basketball, she broke the men's record for scoring also. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of what put it on another level. And I don't see any reason why the shoe companies and all the other companies that follow are not going to show up to be there. And, and, just, sorry, and I'm curious, just as far as going into the next year's tournament, yeah. I know it's a year away here, yeah. but is there a carryover? I know they start selling ads and other things and try to get commitments earlier. Can they leverage the popularity that they got out of this tournament for next year, even though we don't know who's going to yeah, be I, there? I, I yeah, I think absolutely. Yeah. I think you're going to see up, you know, up that kind of pre-buying for, for yeah. the tournament is yeah. going to broaden. I also think brands see, you know, kind of it's the right time for it to yeah. be essentially recognizing not only the men's game, but recognize the women's game. We saw it in um, World Cup soccer with the female team. Yep. So I think it, I, th- I, I think there's no doubt brands are going to put that in their plans to be part of this this movement almost. Yeah, taking advantage, capitalizing on this idea that women's sports having a big, big moment. Yeah. Mark, really appreciate it. Mark Thank Douglas you. is president and CEO of Mountain and Advertising Platform. Um, in terms of how markets close on the day remained, it was kind of a met day. Everyone was obsessed with the eclipse. If you look at um, average volume uh, at the time in terms of 2.30 to about 3.35 p.m. Yeah. In, during New York trading, volume completely dropped off. Yeah, I think a lot of people had already checked out. A lot of people already made plans to see this. Keep in mind, a lot of kids yeah. were out of school today for a variety of reasons. So that keeps, of course, people either away from home or away from work or at least distracted. Right. And those who were at work, Come on, they went outside and they put on their glasses. They looked at the sun for 20 minutes, hopefully, with their glasses on. Well, hopefully they looked at their glasses, Carla. You were rubbing your eyes a little bit earlier here. I know, I hope I know. you uh, remember. I still, I'm still seeing a bit of spots. I had my glasses on the whole look time, at me, but you know. Can you see me? Uh. How, many, how many fingers am I holding? <laughs> Actually, look at me, Scarlett. You know what this means? I am the captain now. <laughs> oh, is that right? Okay. <laughs> That's my tease for you, Scarlett. All right. Uh, when we come back, we're going to do a On This Day in History. We're going to look back at Captain Phillips, the Marist, Alabama, uh-huh. and the peak in Somali maritime piracy question to ponder after we uh, come back from the break. How many known pirate attacks, Scarlett, occurred off the Somali coast in 2009? That was the year the Maersk, Alabama was hijacked. Hundreds? We're going to have the answer when we come back. This is Bloomberg. On this day, April 8th, back in 2009, the shipping giant AP Mola Maersk said a container ship with the U.S. crew of 20 people was seized by pirates. This is about 300 miles off the Somali coast. Now, while the capture and rescue of the Maersk, Alabama, was dramatic enough to get the Hollywood treatment, yeah, complete with the wholesome Tom Hanks portraying the titular Captain Phillips, the incident was part of a larger groundswell in maritime piracy that sucked billions of dollars a year from the global economy. In the days surrounding the Alabama's capture, pirates also hijacked a British-owned cargo ship, a French yacht, a German container ship, a Taiwanese trawler, and a Yemeni tugboat, just within a matter of days. It was a spate of 199 hijackings that year alone around the Horn of Africa and the Western Indian Ocean. That's according to the EU Naval Force, which monitors activities in those waters. That was up from just 23 attacks the previous year. Now, the number of incidents, which include both successful hijackings and failed attempts, continue to climb in 2010 and in 2011, holding above that 200 mark. The Alabama's capture thrust the issue into the spotlight and onto television news. The dramatic seizure on April 8, 2009, was followed by a quick retaking of the ship by the crew hours later, but that then was followed by a four-day pursuit of those pirates who had kidnapped Captain Phillips and fled in a lifeboat. The ordeal did finally end on April 12th when the U.S. Navy sharpshooters killed three of the pirates. The fourth, Abdullahi Muse, that was the one depicted in the film telling Tom Hanks that I am the captain now. He was captured alive, brought into the U.S. for trial, and in 2011 sentenced to more than 30 years in prison. The high-profile trial, as well as the aggressive patrolling by government vessels that ensued after that, led to a dramatic drop in the number of attacks, which by 2014 fell into the single digits. 
Now, there is concern, though, right now of increased activity in that region. At the end of last year, the first ship hijacking in the waters off Somalia took place since 2017. Four weeks ago, a Bangladeshi bulk commodity carrier was boarded by armed men about 600 miles off the coast. And just a few days later, the Indian Navy had to be called in to rescue 17 hostages from a separate ship in the Arabian Sea. Now, while it's difficult to peg the exact cost of piracy to the economy, the World Bank did take a look at it back in 2010, saying that when the shortest shipping route between two countries is uh, through piracy-infected waters is looked at, the additional cost of trade between them is equivalent to an increase of 0.75 to 1.49 percentage points in total ad valorem trade costs. You put that in plain English, what does it mean? That means that in 2010, when you had about $1.6 trillion in global trade traveling along the Somali coast, piracy cost the global economy in absolute terms an estimated $18 billion that year alone. Scarlett? Some incredible numbers there. And it's one reason why, of course, a lot of uh, countries want to reshore a lot of manufacturing so that they can at least make things a little more efficient, a little more of a direct line. And one example of that is Taiwan Semiconductor getting more than $11 billion in grants and loans from the U.S. in order to help it build factories in Arizona. Now, this is part of President Biden's latest effort to boost the production of chips at scale. Joining us for more now is Washington uh, co-host of, excuse me, from Washington, is co-host of Bloomberg's Balance of Power, Kelly Lines. And Kelly, TSMC was already going to build two factories in Arizona. Now, with this extra infusion, it's committing to a third. Yeah, that's right, Scarlett. So the total investment TSMC will be making in the state of Arizona is to the tune of about $65 billion. And they'll be getting, obviously, U.S. help to do that, about $6.6 billion in loans and then up to another uh, $5 billion in grants. This third factory in particular, though, is going to focus on next-gen two-nanometer chips. These are the kinds of chips you need to power technology like artificial intelligence. And the Commerce Department says it's not just AI. It also could be uh, for military purposes as well. And all said, the Commerce Department says this will add about six. 6,000 high-tech manufacturing jobs and roughly 20,000 construction jobs to the state of Arizona. And of course, TMC, TSMC is not the only company that is getting this kind uh, of help from the United States. Intel has been awarded grants of more than $8 billion. When you include the loans in that, we're talking the tune of roughly $20 billion. And there's still plenty of money to yeah. dole out. About $19 billion of the $39 billion in grants uh, included in the CHIPS Act, which passed in 2022, have yet to be doled out. Samsung, though, is expected to get about about six billion of that. This is a lot of money sloshing around, Kelly. And I know we've already heard mm. both from TSMC as well as Intel saying that they actually are having some issues in hiring. Uh, so, I mean, it's also, OK, yeah, you give us the money, we'll build this. But at some point they have to fill uh, those factories with actual people who have the technical know-how to do those jobs. Yeah, that's absolutely true, Romaine, in terms of getting the high-skilled workers who can actually uh, be in these fabs and creating this kind of technology. The construction workers who would actually build these factories, of course, entirely separate. It is worth keeping in mind, though, that these are longer-term projects. All of this is not going to be online immediately. The two other factories TSMC had already planned in Arizona are not set to go live until 2025 and 2028. A lot of these other uh, investments will take years to actually come to fruition. And, of course, for the Biden administration, which in part is trying to invest in in American manufacturing to shore up the American economy and create jobs in the election year, or at least be seen taking steps to do so. A lot of this won't actually be felt yet. And of course, in addition to the political implications, there is also the geoeconomic concerns as well, because part of the reason the CHIPS Act passed in the U.S. is pushing semiconductor manufacturing in the first place is to make sure we aren't overly reliant for on China, for example, for this technology and also stopping China from developing these kind of uh, advanced yeah. semiconductors is something this administration cares very much about and why we've seen export controls be put into place. And that certainly is the key. Kelly, we're going to let you go. Kelly's got to prepare for her show, Balance of Power, coming up just after this program along with Joe Matthew. But I want to pick up on our last point there, specifically about the U.S. trying to create some distance between itself and China, at least on the manufacturing side. Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, just wrapping up a visit uh, to that nation and imploring leaders there in Beijing to fundamentally rethink their economic growth strategy. Here's what she had to say. China is now simply too large for the rest of the world to absorb this enormous capacity. Actions taken by the PRC today can shift world prices. And when the global market is flooded by artificially cheap Chinese products, the viability of American and other foreign firms is put into question. 
the U.S. Treasury Secretary, speaking at a press conference a little bit earlier. Joining us right now is Mary Lovely. She's senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. And Mary, uh, you know, it was kind of interesting, her comments, and not surprising, if you will. I guess what I was surprised about was, I guess, some of the bluntness uh, to it as well. I mean, is this the dialogue right now? that the U.S. and China are going to have, basically us trying to tell them how to run their economy and the Chinese telling us to basically mind our own business? Well, Romaine, I think you picked just a perfect clip from her visit. It captures really the fears that the U.S., the EU, and others have about the coming export surge from China. So really, this is not about something that's happened in the past. It's what we're fearing is happening in the future and what we're trying to avoid. Uh, in some sense, you can think of this as the U.S. and the EU and other countries saying, we don't want to see a repeat of what we saw, say, for example, in solar. Mm -hmm. Now, Secretary Yellen is known for her bluntness. So I'm not surprised that she spoke uh, frankly with the Chinese uh, and, you know, they they understand her position. I think they disagree with it, but right. they understand her position. Is that reconcilable, though? Because when I think about the idea of the U.S. and China trying to improve relations and then at the same token, we're talking about the U.S. trying to build chip factories and uh, make sort of other sort of onshoring and economic commitments that effectively would loosen our reliance or lessen our reliance on China. Uh, are those actually compatible goals? You know, this, this is a really good question because Secretary Yellen has said repeatedly that decoupling from China is impossible and destabilizing for the global economy. So the question that I have for her is, where are we going to continue integration? We hear a lot of talk about moving away from China, diversifying away from China. We're uh, spending a lot of uh, taxpayer money on the subsidies and semiconductors and in EVs, all fine. But where does it stop? What are the options for integration with China? What would we like to see China do? If we go back to problems that we had with the Japanese back in the 1980s, we asked them to voluntarily restrain their exports to the United States. Such voluntary export restraints are no longer allowed under the WTO, mm. but it's been a while before, since the U.S. has paid attention to what the WTO <laughs> says we can and can't do. That's a good reminder, certainly. Um, she hammered Chinese officials for exporting too many clean energy goods in particular. You mentioned solar. That was what we were worried about a decade ago. Today, we're worried about EVs. Is there any evidence that China is dumping its EVs on global, in global markets? No. Usually, the EV test would be if you're selling at a, a, a price that's lower in the foreign market than at home. And in fact, China is getting quite a premium to sell its EVs in Europe. It's one reason why it would like to sell more. They'd be profitable. No, I think the concern goes back to the state subsidies that many of these firms, you know, received mm -hmm. in the past. Uh, but we're seeing in the EU and in the U.S. that such subsidies are also needed in the U.S. or in the Europe to get the industry started, to make the transition away from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles. Right, absolutely. And we're starting to see subsidies in the high-tech space uh, with advanced chips, for instance, with what's going on with TSMC. Um, Romaine talked about how it was a little surprising to hear just how blunt Secretary Yellen was. Nevertheless, um, the reporting indicates that uh, the Chinese gave her a very warm reception. Was there actually a dialogue? What did Beijing have to say to Janet Yellen? What was their message to her? Well, I don't think we really know. I do know that the Chinese disagree with her with the analysis that there is a coming export surge that is, in some sense, unfair or taking advantage of the rules. The Chinese believe that they have developed over many years a superior technology. And in fact, that is true. When we look at CATL and other companies, their battery technologies are now being licensed by foreign firms. China has a head start. And we need to, I think, just honestly admit that, but also tell the Chinese, as Secretary Allen surely did, the U.S. can't see, sit, sit by and watch its auto sector disappear. Neither can the EU. So it's simply there has to be some middle way. What the Chinese offered or other offers that were made by Secretary Biden, I'm sorry, Secretary Yellen, we simply don't know. All right, Mary, always wonderful to get your insights here. Mary Lovely over at the Peterson Institute, a closer look at U.S.-China relations on the heels of that visit over to Beijing by Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. All right, stick with us here on The Close. We're going to set you up for some of the big market-moving events over the next 24 hours. What to Watch is up next. This is Bloomberg.
All right, well, today was, well, I guess a little bit of a mad day here. Things the could solar pick eclipse up was a big that. deal. Yeah, well, things could pick up over the next 24 hours, and investors are actually really going to be keeping an eye on Boeing. They are set to release those first quarter delivery numbers tomorrow at about 11 a.m. Uh, for more on what to expect, we're joined right now by George Ferguson, Bloomberg Intelligence, a senior airline analyst. And uh, let's start off, of course, uh, George, with the big planes, a 777. I assume that number is going to be, what, zero, squadoosh? Uh, so I, I think you said triple seven, and think we would, uh, we think there might be about three of those delivered during during the quarter. Yeah, three of those. That gives you an indication of what's going on there. The bigger concern is just how Boeing gets through this next period, uh, all of April, in in terms of cash and preserving cash because they're trying to reintegrate Spirit Aerosystems. So the numbers of the deliveries don't matter as much as what it says about its cash usage, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean. Cash burn is going to be directly proportional to deliveries. I think everybody's expecting a pretty rough quarter. Mm -hmm. You know, we're kind of looking for about 70, 737 deliveries, where we thought they could have been, you know, 100 or so. Um, but I think the biggest number, yes, will be, you know, CFO West, West indicated there'd be about a four to four and a half billion dollar cash burn during the quarter. I think anything less than that will make this, a, you know, a better quarter than expectations would make the market happier to the extent Boeing can sh shepherd cash here and hold on to the balance sheet. Tomorrow, we won't necessarily know that, right? They just typically uh, re release deliveries. I think still, if we saw significantly less than 70 or so uh, 737s, it would be cause for concern that things were were more broken than we kind of all expect in the yeah. uh, in the manufacturing process. All right, we're going to keep an eye on that. George Ferguson of Bloomberg Intelligence also keep an eye on that. Be sure to check out his research on the Bloomberg Terminal as we relate those uh, numbers. We're also going to get some other numbers as well. We have a big summit uh, going taking place over in Asia, the inaugural HSBC Global Investment Summit. Yeah, that's right. It's going to be day two. There's going to be a number of big speakers, including former St. Louis Fed President James Bullard and current CFTC Commissioner Caroline Feim. So we're going to bring you all the headlines that that generates. Yeah, Satya Nadella also and a few other CEOs back here in the U.S. We're actually going to get uh, some read on small business optimism, the NFIB numbers. Yeah, it's likely yeah. to take a somewhat lower in the month of March uh, as we've seen job layoffs continue. So that's going to be something we watch carefully. And we were just talking about those Boeing delivers. That's coming at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Tune in to Bloomberg for full coverage of that. And guess what, Scarlett? I know you missed them. The House and the Senate, they're back. Do you think the Senate's going to take up the TikTok bill? They got a lot to do. Not just a TikTok bill, but of course the Ukraine aid. There's yeah. uh, the funding for the bridge collapse. And then I think, I don't know what the heck Marjorie Taylor Greene's been on lately, but apparently She's she wants own. to impeach somebody. So uh, stick around if you want to know more about what's going to happen in Congress. Balance of Power is up next. Scarlett and I will be back tomorrow right here on The Close.